Rebecca, we're here in Tucson. The conference toward the science of consciousness is their 20th year, but for you and I, it's our first year. So what do you think is going on here? What's going on here? <laughs> um, it, it's, this is a, a problem, consciousness, uh, how to explain the fact uh, that we're conscious, mm -hmm. that uh, just draws out such a spectrum mm -hmm. of differences of point of view, and, and differences that go very deep down. You know, I think that there are differences that completely orient you toward reality. And so, uh, um, you know, the, the, when people disagree, they disagree very, very sharply. And that's fascinating to see. And I see almost the full spectrum of points of view here. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's, there's idealism that's been uh, spoken about. There. People think that only consciousness it's is It's only real. consciousness, a, a, some, some putting it forth um, uh, on an almost mystical basis, um, but others on a strictly, like Don Hoffman, on a strictly scientific basis. Right. Um, there's certainly, you know, materialism of various sorts, eliminative materialism, reductive materialism, non-reductive materialism. Um, the one thing that I haven't really seen is, is full body dualism, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that I haven't heard. And that, you know, that's, that's sort of interesting. That it, it, yeah, that, that, that is. Uh, I mean, normally that's a <clears throat> religious position, but there are some philosophers, of course, who have uh, supported dualism without a religious yeah, position. Yeah, and I would bet that that's pretty much the person in the street point of view, mm -hmm. you know, sure. that there's my mind and my sure. body and my, my mind could possibly survive my death and, and, and all of right. these sorts of so, things. So you come here really almost schizophrenically. One is a, as a philosopher who yes. focused on the philosophy of mind, among other things, and the other as a novelist. Right. And uh, you like right. to see how all these uh, crazy people, including me, believe, why they believe what they believe. Oh, yes. Well, well yes. It's a, and I really do feel myself, you know, uh, very split in a conference like this because as a philosopher, I'm always just trying to isolate what the argument is and, you know, what are the hidden premises and how you could attack it. And, you know, and that's part of my brain is always doing that. Uh, but part of it is, man, what is it like to believe that? Yeah, you know, that yeah, is yeah. just, uh, that, that, that's so different from the way I look at the world. I wish I could insinuate myself into your point of view and know exactly how the world mm. looks to you, and, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, both of those things are always going on when I'm at a conference like this. When we have this very broad spectrum of belief, one of the things that strikes me here is that almost everyone is pretty sure that their belief is the right one. Now that sounds almost like a tautology because if you didn't think it was right, you wouldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. But in, in this case, when you are uh, well educated at the very least, and, and many people are professional scientists or philosophers here, uh, to feel so strongly that you have the right position when, when you have this enormous breadth of other positions, yes. uh, to me is one of the interesting sociology uh, 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 structures of, of how this society of consciousness works. I think you're absolutely right, and I think that that in itself calls for an explanation. Yes. Um, <clears throat> you don't find that in any other scientific area where they have such a divergence but of you, views. But you do find it in all philosophical issues, uh -huh, I would say. Uh -huh. And so when people disagree on, oh, even, you know, naturalism versus theism, or, right. say, right. <laughs> or, or, or in philosophy of mathematics, or in the interpretation of mm. quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. amazing <clears throat> passions um, come forth. And I think what we have in philosophy is questions that are underdetermined under by all the available facts. Mm -hmm. Um, that's why they're philosophical. They're right. not scientific. They're, we can't, we're not waiting for a new fact that's going to decide this. We maybe have all the facts available to us, and it's a matter of trying to arrange them in a, in a way that pleases us. And what comes into play is our entire orientation toward reality, our philosophical temperament, our habits of mind, just the way we go about thinking. And so when you're disagreeing here, you're disagreeing on a character characterological or temperamental mm, mm, uh, mm, level mm, mm. and it and it explains the passions that are, are put forth much more is at stake 
um, than just a, a, a scientific disagreement. You make a very interesting point by saying that maybe we do have all the facts available to us, but it's the nature of the question or the structure of it that, that is the issue. Now, most people, at least regarding consciousness, would say that's not true. We still have a lot more scientific facts, and, and indeed, we have a great deal to learn about the brain. But the question is, if you progress scientifically about the brain along the lines that we think we can, and I was trained in brain science, so I know the neurophysiology and all, neurochemistry, etc., uh, is it in principle possible following that same path to its, to its end or its conclusion? We understand everything about the brain. Will you have an answer at that point? Yeah, and that is, that's of course, you know, the distinction that was made um, by Dave Chalmers, you know, 20 years ago, between the hard problem and the easy problems. Mm -hmm. Can making progress in the so-called easy problems right. uh, give us, which are all problems in um, uh, how either... Things what, what was how, it? how things work. I mean, how, how, things how we work. do work. things. They're, and they're all in objective language, right, in right. scientific language. Right. So, you know, it's basically there's cognitive science delineating the different capacities uh, for, 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 for information processing. Uh, there's evolutionary biology giving you the adaptive functions of these different capacities for information processing. And then there's neuroscience giving you mapping the different areas for in information processing and trying to get a finer and finer description of what is actually going on there. And that those are basically the three areas of science that are making progress and they are making progress, uh, but will they ever uh, be able to tell me when I, we get a complete description, if we if we do, um, you know, do you see red the way I see blue? <laughs> <laughs> right, that's that childhood yeah. question. Exactly. exactly. You, you know, what is the felt yeah. quality of your experience? And, and in those three areas, there are two 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 ultimate questions. One, can we ever know, and can we ever keep it to the end? Yeah. And the second, the heart, the heart, a tougher question is: If we do know everything, will that still solve the problem? Yes. What's your feeling on that? Okay, so I have two different views about this. <laughs> um, one is I call my much more despairing view, and that is, you know, we are mechanisms for processing information. These processes take place in the brain, um, and we can understand everything about these processes except why it feels like mm -hmm. something right, right. to do this. Uh, and that is simply a contingent fact about the brain processes that we happen to be. So we're never going to get there. It's not, it's not even that you know the problem is in principle so difficult. It's so, it's so difficult for us. It's relative to us, relative to the cognitive capacities that we have been bequeathed by natural selection. Um, so we're never going to get there. The, my more optimistic view is we've been attacking the problem of matter, of, you know, we are material things, and we've been attacking the problem of, you know, what are the properties of matter um, uh, with a particular methodology that was uh, suggested at the very end of Plato's life in the Timaeus, but which was taken up by in the 17th century by Kepler, by Galileo, and then, you know, certainly big time by Newton. And that is to use mathematical descriptions to get at uh, matter, uh, to infer the properties of matter that we don't observe, but we can scientifically access. How? Through mathematics. And that gives us these structural features of little bits of matter in motion. Um, and maybe we're just never going to get out the description of what certain material, materially organized things feel uh, from this kind of mathematical description. That doesn't mean we can't somehow access it. It only means that we, 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 we await a new Galileo that's going to give us a new way of accessing the properties of, of, uh, of matter, and then maybe we'll be able to get to it. Maybe what we're seeing, for example, in the most sophisticated areas of physics right now, the tension, if not the downright inconsistency between relativity theory and quantum mechanics is we're seeing in a different way the limits of trying to get at a complete description of matter um, and maybe when we when that breaks open into a new methodology uh, we'll also be able to 
get at properties that yield consciousness. I sense your pessimistic self may be a little stronger than your optimistic self. I don't know. I think I'm actually evenly, <laughs> even <laughs> okay. divided. You know, my, the optimistic self is so very optimistic because it's sort of like, um, uh, well, you know, we, uh, something big, something amazing, you know, that, that, that nobody before Kepler and Galileo could have dreamt of, um, is, is, is a, is going to, is going to fall out. And, uh, you know, just a new methodology, something as rich as what physics has given us up until this point. But, you know, there it was for, for hundreds of years, we were using uh, Aristotelian teleology and just get, getting nowhere. It wasn't, necessary that we would find this way of wedding together empiricism and mathematical description that has yielded just this abundant knowledge of the material universe. It wasn't preordained that we were going to do that, but we did it. So maybe we we're going to do the next stage. And, you know, that to me is so exciting, you know. Mm -hmm. But it, it all it takes is extraordinary genius. <laughs>